Chris uh, just took a job as the director of the HEAL project, which is kind of a consortium of universities and NGOs to understand the links between nature and human health, essentially. Um, he's a good guy to do that because he's got um, both a PhD and a master's in public health from Berkeley, a uh, PhD in ecology and a master's in public health. Um, and he works on a whole different range with a whole wide range of issues uh, linking ecosystems and ecosystem change and concrete human health outcomes. Um, he directs HEAL, which is kind of this virtual thing linking lots of institutions, but he sits at the Harvard Center for Health and the Global Environment. Um, uh, in a group led by um, a collaborator, Alicia's and mine, um, and Brendan's as well, working on these same issues. So he's up here to sort of see what's going on at UVM at this interface between ecosystems and health as he takes over the leadership of this consortium that's knitted us together with lots of other groups over time. Um, and I'm, you know, typically roped him in and given a talk. So um, the one last thing I'll say about. Um, Chris is that he's been working since 1999 in Madagascar on these very issues, like a really impressive long-term commitment to understanding a particular system, a social ecological one, um, which I'm sure he'll sprinkle in among these things. But the stories he has about coups and getting blood samples out of Madagascar um, and all the way home without warming them up are pretty impressive and indicate like a lot of dedication to this as well. So, Anyway, without any other time from me, here's Chris, and if anybody wants to talk with him, he's here for the rest of the day, but then has to drive home before the snow, so there's a few cracks of time to chat with him, if so you haven't gotten on the schedule yeah. before. Okay, take it away, Chris. Yeah, the Madagascar stuff might be more of a, a heavy dose than a spring thing, but you guys can be the judge <laughs> Okay. <of that. laughs> So as Taylor mentioned, I just recently took over this new role of directing HEAL, so I'm about a month in, and so I, my dual purpose here is really to demonstrate what's part of the HEAL portfolio, but also to give you guys some concrete examples of some of the research that I've done in the past, which I think is representative of a lot of what HEAL is designed to do. So just to give you a guide for the talk, what I'm really hoping to do is talk about these intersections, this nexus between environmental change and human health, and to go through certain examples of where ecosystem function meets non-communicable disease, infectious disease, nutrition, and talk about some kind of current research highlights that haven't been published but that we're currently working on. Our basic frame is that there are these very serious global megatrends in the environment. There's land use change, there's wildlife population depletion, there's biodiversity loss, various forms of ecosystem transformation that don't only have a singular effect on biodiversity and the integrity of ecosystems, but also have very real, tangible downstream effects on human well-being and human health. So that's kind of the framing, the background context of why HEAL arose. HEAL is a 25 institution consortium. It's designed to really tackle these data gaps that exist that attempt to link ecosystem functioning with human health. And so there are very intuitive connections where people would think intact ecosystems means that someone's well-being or someone's health might be in a better place. And yet the actual empirical evidence, the quantified evidence demonstrating those things has really been underexplored by the scientific community. And so what HEAL's primary objective to do is become a knowledge producer attacking some of those links that have been underexplored. This again is part of the background context of why we are in place. All of these different fields, disciplines, approaches have been operating in silos. So people that are working in the environment are working here, human health here, food security there, development there. Very few of us are speaking to each other and trying to attack an issue in a kind of concerted and joint fashion. So part of what HEAL is really trying to do is to broaden constituencies of people that are interested in conservation. We very much kind of welcome the critique that not all ecosystems are beneficial to human health. That if you put cement all over a wetland, you are definitely reducing your risk for malaria. And yet there are a number of different benefits from that ecosystem service that you might be disturbing different aspects of human health. And so what we're really trying to do is to find win-win examples of where conserving biodiversity also produces some sort of beneficial health effect. And so that's kind of our bias and where we're, where we're sampling and trying to understand these relationships. We think very theoretically about 
the ways in which an ecosystem might impact human health. We can think about humans starting off in these intact natural ecosystems. And as a development unfolds, as time unfolds, we move into engineered infrastructures where people now have access to markets. And yet not all people are able to make that jump into development in the same way. What we tend to see is that the poor fall off. And so as increased capital arises, increased inequality also arises. And what happens to the poor is that they have, they've, they're unable to adjust to living in these engineered infrastructures because they don't have the financial capacity to, bu to buy these prohibitively expensive substitutes for what nature could provide freely. And so what we see is this loss of natural insurance. People that used to rely on the forest for food, for shelter, for medicines, for biomass, for energy, all of these things are now degraded or destroyed or absent, and yet they can't afford financial substitutes. And so we really see that this group tends to suffer the most as ecosystem services are lost. And so a primary focus of what HEAL is trying to do is to try to identify these vulnerable communities, this kind of bottom billion that lives around the world and is extremely resource reliant or ecosystem service reliant and tries to identify these connections between ecosystem service provisioning and human health. So as an example of some of the work that we're doing, this is by a colleague that Taylor was mentioning that works with uh, the Alicia and I. Uh, this is a project looking at an ecosystem functioning and non-communicable diseases. So it links deforestation in Indonesia to cardiopulmonary disease within this kind of same region. And so it thinks about the effects that deforestation, <coughs> Sweden agriculture, the kind of rising flux of oil palm industry has on people's health and well-being within equatorial Asia. And so the models that we've been doing is looking at how kind of over the past 20 to 30 years, we've seen a tremendous amount of destruction of the forests in Indonesia. And by 2100, we could expect that there is maybe three quarters of the original forest to be gone. This, of course, has destructive elements to biodiversity, conservation, environmental integrity. But this also has a very significant health toll. And so what this project is really trying to address is that health toll. So what we see here is the fire observa observations from satellite imagery. This is June 20th to 29th, which was very much in the news. It's this incredibly hazy event in Singapore, like the greatest haze event that they've had in decades. Uh, and you can see here kind of the smoke concentrations from the surface air. And so they're using these atmospheric transport models. And the group that's working with this is kind of a joint group from Columbia and Harvard School of Public Health. And it's kind of the same team that created the EPA atmospheric transport models to use this in a very fine scale in Indonesia to identify particular areas of concern where burning has the heaviest human health toll in terms of particulate matter uh, consumption. So what we see in terms of the study design is that they wanted to model the emissions associated with different land use types. Then also model the transport chemistry uh, from an atmospheric chemistry point of view, and then model the population level exposures. And what they found is that when you look at these emissions, the different wind trajectories and circulation patterns, and the ways in which particulate matter, PEM 2.5 in particular, lands on a population, there are very interesting facts that arise. So in an area like Kalimantan, this might not be the most destructive burning to human health in these very wealthy cities like Singapore or Kuala Lumpur. And yet, if we go back, you can see that a lot of this burning that happens here, because of the westerlies that come from uh, this general region in Sumatra, a lot of this particulate matter lands directly on Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and Palembang. And I just sat in on their most recent meeting. Very, very interesting results of an almost tenfold increase in particulate matter in Singapore, similar in Kuala Lumpur, and a nearly kind of 120 parts per million of particulate matter in Palembang. These are all kind of way, way, way above kind of the most polluted, polluted cities in China. Uh, extremely kind of a, a particular area of concern for us with regards to human health. And they're doing very fine scale modeling to say, if we conserve peatland in this area, if we mitigate certain amounts of environmental change in that area, what would be the downstream health benefits? And then by providing this type of data to something like the government of Singapore to say, 
by conserving forests in Indonesia, this would be the kind of reduced amount of health, health subsidies that you need to provide. It becomes this kind of compelling sustainable financing mechanism for conservation. Moving into ecosystem function and infectious disease, this whole field of disease ecology is probably the most well-developed subset of these broad environment and human health connections. So I want to just go through a few examples, some heal examples, other not. Uh, so one particular heal module that we have focused on is looking at the human health impacts of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. This is run by Dr. Jonathan Patz from University of Wisconsin. And it's looking at the ways in which deforestation, fragmentation, <coughs> land use change in the Amazon has, a, has an effect on the incidence of malaria in this area. And so what they tend to find is that fragmentation, deforestation creates very specific ecotones that lend themselves to a disproportionate abundance increase of particular types of Anopheles mosquitoes. And so it causes community shifts and it causes shifts in abundance in addition to the diversity shifts. And so Anopheles darlingi, which is a particularly efficient vector of malaria, becomes hyperabundant in these areas that are now exposed to sunshine. And this then increases the incidence of malaria within these areas. And so this has become a somewhat compelling case for the Ministry of Health in Brazil to understand ways in which deforestation, forest fragmentation have had downstream effects on human health and ways in which forest conservation could actually be more beneficial from both an economics point of view and a human well-being point of view uh, by just looking at this one disease in specific. So this is a very hotly debated topic within our field, this idea of the dilution effect. What I'm presenting to you now is kind of the, what is considered to be the gold standard to say that the dilution effect exists. And so it's this case, and forgive me if this audience already is very well versed in this, but I'll start, okay. So this, the idea of a dilution effect is that with increasing levels of biodiversity, so a more intact ecosystem, you have more species diversity, and any particular vector of a certain disease would then be minimized in abundance. And so here we have something like a white-footed mouse, which we know is a carrier for Lyme disease, carried by this back leg tick. The Virginia opossum is another type of species that hosts the back leg tick, which is the vector for Lyme disease. So in intact ecosystems on the east coast of the US, we see both the Virginia opossum and the white-footed mouse being abundant. And yet, in more deforested habitat, habitats, more fragmented habitats, you tend to see that certain species will leave first. And so this larger Virginia opossum species, as compared to the white-footed mouse species, will leave first when there's habitat disturbance. You can see kind of the grooming statistics and the ways in which the ticks feed and become infected. Much higher grooming, much lesser rates of infection in ticks and opossums much less grooming, much higher rates of infected ticks and white-footed mice. And so what we see is a very concrete example of the ways in which reducing levels of diversity through ecosystem disturbance has a direct effect on the risk for disease exposure in a case like Lyme disease. What we also see here, because a lot of people critiqued the dilution effect, saying that do we have any theoretical underpinning to say Yes, the species that are the most hardy, the ones that will be left behind when there's ecosystem disturbance, will be the ones that are more predisposed to be disease carriers that are of importance to humans. And so we don't really know that the ones that are being left behind are the ones that are the greatest risk for being carriers. There is this new evidence um, from a group at um, CU Boulder that shows that species that are the most common and the most abundant have the highest disease competence within one particular disease in a group of frogs in lakes in California. And so what they've shown is that the ones that tend to disappear the most, so this is the percentage of ponds that have these different species of frogs. This one is found nearly all of them, so this is kind of the commonness index, so this one is the most common. This is the abundance index, so the ones that are most common, also the most abundant, and this is the disease competence. And so you can so it's saying that this is the most likely to host this one particular disease of interest. So it's a carrier for that disease. So high competence is bad. High competence is bad. Right. 
And so this one example is the only empirical evidence that I'm aware of that demonstrates this factor. This disease is not something that is of concern to humans, but it's the only ecological evidence that I've seen. So I think that this is still very much an open area of research to say whether or not the dilution effect is relevant. I think the critiques to the dilution effect are relevant. I think that there's also, it's also kind of begging to be further understood because it would be a, a great thing to find out that <laughs> Maintaining ecosystem integrity reduces our risk for uh, certain types of diseases. Yes. So it, um, maybe maybe you haven't gotten to the or something like that. So you're, you're showing that if you have an abundant species that's high competence, that you then you're more likely to have that disease spread to the community. So in that slide, you're not necessarily showing that if you change that, you're changing the competence. Is that true, or are you just make, is that just an assumption that you're making? That would be an assumption that we're making based on linking these two pieces of evidence that in the one, I'm, I'm just saying that there was no evidence in the tick case that, simple, or in the tick case there is kind of this idea that simplification causes an increased disease risk burden, but it hadn't been generalized to other ecosystems and it hadn't been studied in a very empirically careful way. In this frog example, it had been shown in a statistically rigorous way that that was the case but that was not of a disease of concern to humans. Um, I don't think that it's been studied enough for me to make an assertion as to what I really think about kind of pro or cons in terms of the dilution effects. Sorry if that didn't perfectly answer your question. And so what we see in terms of community competence and species richness is that as species richness increases, the overall community <coughs> competence for diseases is reduced. So now I want to move into some case studies from my own work in Madagascar. I work in the northeast. It's in the Makura watershed. It's the largest remaining tract of rainforest in Madagascar, around 4,000 square kilometers. Uh, Madagascar in general, the case is kind of clear if you talk to all the conservationists, that this is an area of conservation concern, biodiversity hotspot. 85% of everything in the country is endemic. This is flora and fauna. 50% of all floral diversity in Madagascar is found just within the Makira watershed. And if you extrapolate that to global rates of endemism and species biodiversity, you could estimate that around 1% of all floral diversity is found just within this one watershed. Very, very interesting area from a conservation point of view. And yet, very complicated in terms of the ways in which local people are using biodiversity and land that don't necessarily facilitate conservation. So from a disease emergence point of view, Globally, 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature, meaning they're transferred from animals to humans. Uh, these are just a few examples, SARS, HIV, rabies, avian influenza, etc., that are all originating in animal hosts and being transferred to humans. Um, I've been working with the Global Viral <coughs> Forecasting Initiative. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Nathan Wolf and his work. So his laboratory is analyzing a lot of our samples right now. Uh, so is Nathan. He's called himself a virus hunter and uh, he's doing some very interesting work and most of what he's famous for is really making links between uh, chimpanzee hunting and disease risk exposure and kind of trying to assess the initial emergence of HIV in Central Africa. And so what we're doing in Madagascar is collecting dried blood spots from animals before they go into the cooking pot Right now, what we have is around 200 wildlife dried blood spots. This is from lemurs, bats, tenrix, carnivores, and kind of the different types of diseases that we're expecting to see, that we're looking for specifically within each of these uh, species combinations. One of the reasons why I think this is very interesting is that local people tend to really believe in their system of traditional ecological knowledge that contact with animals has a tremendous health risk. And so, this, sorry, I don't know why this is a little bit slow. Uh, this gorgeous woman is known locally as the Kalanuru, and she is part of their spiritual cosmology in Madagascar. So this Kalanuru is always envisioned, and this is part of a kind of community art contest that I did uh, for everyone to draw their own version of the Kalanuru. She's always a dwarf with backward facing feet, very long hair, long fingernails, always in a river, eating crabs. <laughs> very, very standard conception of her all throughout the kind of many places that I've worked in Madagascar. And she is the one that passes down taboos to people. 
And so people will have a very complicated and nuanced system of taboos in Madagascar, and there's always a story associated with those taboos that we can't eat this specific species because we'll bleed from our eyes, or our skin will change color, or we'll die. And so there's this very nuanced understanding of zoonotic disease transfer in their own culture. And if I look, so I've surveyed now around 1,200 households over the past 10 years in Madagascar. These are the prevalent statistics at the household level of different types of species that they will have a taboo for. And if you look at this list, just a few things to pay attention to in terms of the plants, things like taro leaves, peanuts, etc., things we very commonly know will have an allergy or an itchy response to something. Uh, also, the hedgehog tenor, 45% of the population has a taboo for that. Most commonly tabooed wildlife species, the common tenric, which looks almost identical to that and is consumed all the time, 3% of the population has a taboo for that. It doesn't even appear on this very long list. So I just want you to keep that in mind. <coughs> What, what, we were wondering what that is, that animal. Oh, the tenor, it looks like a hedgehog. <coughs> and just out of curiosity, I don't know if you even know, do you know if they have taboos against killing animals that kill disease vectors? They don't. All right. Or I've never heard a story like that. So we record all the stories, too. So I'm in the process of synthesizing all of that, but I haven't seen any of that. Yes? And then just, so if you go back, did you also catalog what the reasons why they have the taboo? I have, so I've, I've and, coded all of those. And most of the reasons are... Most of them are health related. But, I mean, how specific can you be? I mean, is it because you'll know you catch an infection from that, or is it you know that eating something has a poison that will cause, you know, diarrhea or something like that? I didn't go down to coding at that okay. level, but that is a very interesting suggestion. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm yeah. just like looking in the sense that they, if they have this traditional knowledge, they must know something about that particular thing that could either have positive health benefits or negative health benefits. So, all of the reasons that they would have a taboo for it are driven out of fear Proof. for a negative health effect. Okay. So but I'm saying a lot of medicines are created because they have some adverse effect that we would love to know how to make you right. really better because we know that you're giving them Yeah, something. that's actually very interesting. So just to go back to this, I won't make you guys hold your breath until I get to the future research stuff. But the hedgehog tenoric, I don't know if any of you saw in the news recently about the bubonic plague epidemic in Madagascar. <clears throat> so it's the largest epidemic of bubonic plague since the Middle Ages. And the hedgehog tenoric has been found to be the most efficient vector for the bubonic plague. 0% mortality from the plague, whereas rats, there's only about a 20% survival rate from bubonic plague when it's a vector. So when rats get it in the population, yes, this very easily transfers to humans, but 80% of them are wiped out from it. So it doesn't last long in rat communities. Hedgehog tenrex, 100% immunity to bubonic plague. Still trying to figure out exactly how that happens, but there's new research that just came out this past year demonstrating that. Mm -hmm. And for me, kind of bells started to go off that this was such an interesting result that kind of coded with a lot of the anthropological research that I've been doing. Can you normalize these to account for sort of the geography of where people were? For example, I see octopus on the list, but an inland community probably wouldn't have a taboo again. It would still have it because many of these are ancestral taboos. Okay. And the octopus is interesting, so there's more witchcraft-related taboos to health-motivated taboos, and the octopus falls into the witchcraft-related. So anything that's considered round or has the word round in Malagasy, which means buri, is tabooed, and the octopus, is, the name for it is burita. So it's kind of this round animal, so that's why it's tabooed. Moving into what more of my focus area is, looking at these connections between ecosystem function and nutrition, there was an interesting paper um, by Eilers et al. looking at the content of the kind of global food supply and the various vitamins and nutrients that would be affected <coughs> by declines in pollinators. And what they found is that for a large amount of things, there would be very little effect. And so what we see here is that this hashed part is from animal pollinators, this is self or wind pollination, and this was kind of independent of pollination. And what we see is that for many things there's very little reliance on animal pollination, and then we move in here to vitamin A, beta carotene, alpha tocopherol, um, some of these things are incredibly reliant on animal pollination systems, and yet this isn't looking at individual vulnerabilities or population level vulnerabilities to the food supply. 
and this is where really interesting work that Taylor and Alicia are doing um, is going to hopefully be showing that <laughs> very soon. And I didn't want to uh, give a teaser with any of the graphs, but they're doing some very exciting work, so stay tuned for that. So what I focus most of my effort on is looking at wildlife as a multi-dimensional ecosystem service. And so from a provisioning service, regulatory service, cultural service, uh, etc., you could think of, this is just all Madagascar as an example, flying foxes as a regulatory service, maintaining forest restructure, uh, seed dispersal, flower dispersal, etc. Things like the FUSA, also a regulatory service in being a natural form of predation, natural form of pest control. So they're eating all of the rats, snakes, insects that are damaging local agriculture. From a cultural service, this is the second largest industry in Madagascar, bringing in money for ecotourism. We don't have robust populations of wildlife. No one wants to come to see that wildlife. Finally, from a provisioning service point of view, and this is what I've tended to focus most of my work on, the sustainable harvest of wildlife could be seen as an ecosystem service. Of course, unsustainable harvest isn't a service to anyone, uh, but there are hopes for certain species like the tenric or like the dwarf lemur, although it's sad to think about killing them. But with the tenric, it's the most fecund mammal on earth. They have up to 32 babies in a litter. Uh, we're doing a mark or capture project with tenrics right now, and very often we'll flip over a female and see 32 nipples. It's kind of this wonder of the mammalian <laughs> <animal. laughs> So they're highly productive and certainly could provide a case for sustainable offtake. So if we think about this intact forest, this is my version of a conceptual model pillar. <laughs> we have dwarf members. They fall in love. They're requiring no effort from humans at all. Fall in love, reproduce, and produce lots of little baby dwarf lemurs. And yet, if we burn down the forest, that wipes out part of their population that's disturbing the service. We then have this degraded forest that doesn't have dwarf lemurs for human consumption. Also, there's kind of direct offtake. That also is a direct threat to this ecosystem service. And so what we're really hoping to do is to promote conservation in a way that we have robust po wildlife populations that can then feed into this type of provisioning service. This unfortunately doesn't work in most areas. What we tend to see is that there is a heavy urban luxury trade for bushmeat. And this is a very sharp contrast to the subsistence aspects of wildlife trade. So what we see in Madagascar in a paper that we just published uh, a few weeks ago is that only about 2% of wildlife harvested in Madagascar is sold, and 0% was commercially sold. And so this is all household to household transactions. So it provides a very interesting case where this really is a scenario where the wildlife harvest is out of subsistence need and not out of commercial greed. And so it provides a different type of ethical framework to operate in when thinking about conservation versus human health and livelihoods. Is that a tenor? It is. Yeah, the tenrics are, they look like rodents of unusually large size from the princess bread. <laughs> so what we see here is kind of prevalence statistics of how many households on average are consuming each taxa of wildlife within the Makira. So around 16% are hunting bats, a quarter are hunting bush pig, 40% are hunting endemic carnivores, nearly 50% are hunting lemurs, and more than 90% are hunting tenrics. And so this, of course, provides an example where a really a population level targeting is required. We can't kind of use the example of Rwandan mountain gorillas and hire the three specialist hunters that were going out and killing them and making them a part of the park service. This needs a development approach, a public health approach to addressing this as a nutritional need. Again, something interesting, 50% of households are hunting lemurs. This is something that's illegal inside or outside of national parks. And so people are putting themselves at risk for something that is out of subsistence need. So my initial work kind of showed that this hunting was unsustainable. So for animals like the fusa, the indri, which is the largest lemur in Madagascar, bamboo lemurs, black and white ruffed lemurs, ai, ai all of these species were being unsustainably harvested according to our initial results. And so it definitely promotes the case for conservation. We need to conserve these species. We need to diminish people's levels of hunting. 
this would eradicate their own food supplies. We'd be no, doing no service to them by letting all of these rates of hunting go unbridled. At the same time, we want to protect biodiversity, promote conservation, and maintain kind of this unique aspect to Madagascar. So what I ended up moving into was looking at this nutritional value of wildlife because this would best help us to understand is this something that if we stop tomorrow with effective conservation monitoring, would that affect the population? And so I ended up creating a study looking at uh, the dynamics between human wildlife consumption and human health. And in addition to being a biodiversity hotspot, we also see in Madagascar that it's an anemia hotspot. So the dark red means that more than 40% of the population is affected by anemia. What we see in Madagascar in pre-adolescence, which was the population I was targeting, 63% of the population is affected by anemia. This is a disease with a huge toll on human health. It's a huge burden of disease. And it was, of course, something that was interesting to me. Most people conceive of meat and they think of protein. At the end of the day, the importance of meat has zero to do with protein. Every vegetarian you'll meet has an adequate supply of protein. Where meat really becomes important is that it's a critical pack of micronutrients. So the vitamin B12, the iron, the zinc, the fatty acids, all of those things are very, very difficult to access in vegetarian diets if you're not supplementing or if you're not being very careful. People in developing countries that don't have a fortified or biofortified food supply are not being very careful because they have no ability to do that. So they're really missing out on a lot of these nutrients. And in fact, the rates of anemia in the US are around 20%. Most people in the US, even if very obese, are still not getting an adequate supply of key nutrients that are very important. And anemia isn't just kind of this tired person's disease. Most people think of it as something that's really not important. One gram per deciliter, so that's usually measured in grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. Uh, one gram per deciliter of hemoglobin decrease causes a 28% increase in moderate mental retardation. Similarly, uh, oh, okay, so these cognitive deficits have also been shown to last 20 years into the future. So those deficits in, in iron that occur between the ages of zero to two <coughs> have a lifelong trajectory. There's no bouncing back after kind of your brain has been demyelinated from lack of iron that lasts for the long term. Similarly, a one gram per deciliter decrease causes a 25% increase in maternal and perinatal mortality. These types of statistics are incredibly relevant to things like the Millennium Development Goals that are really trying to target maternal and perinatal health. And by promoting different nutritional interventions, they could be solving a lot of these issues. Similarly, if conservation could achieve some of what these public health interventions are trying to do, why not? That's even a better case to promote certain aspects of conservation that could facilitate these other kind of global goals. So what we showed in our paper after we measured kind of a 12-month dietary database looking at what people were eating on a daily basis and every month measuring someone's level of hemoglobin was that if you removed all wildlife from the diet and substituted it with a vegetarian source, which is not an altogether unlikely scenario, given that meat is prohibitively expensive in this area, we would see a 30% increase in the rates of anemia in this region. And so this was something that was very interesting to me because it did show that wildlife, subsistence wildlife harvest was incredibly important to local people. And what we would see on average from a biomass standpoint is that around a third of all of the animal source foods that they were consuming came from wildlife. If you disaggregate between poorer and richer households, you see that poorer households are disproportionately more reliant on that ecosystem service. And so what we would see is that the lowest income household, households had almost a threefold increased risk of transitioning into anemia if wildlife was removed from the diet. And so this is, of course, an important issue in terms of equity. So this is a cartoon that was made in one of the Malagasy newspapers and the government is kind of yelling at the wages saying why are you so short when everything else is growing and so that's rice, oil, gas and electric. So as people's lives are becoming more and more expensive for all of these other basic needs they still don't have the money to compensate for all of these other things that they're losing when ecosystem services become degraded. So moving on to some of these current research highlights, one thing that I'm particularly excited to start working on with Taylor, and he kind of 
gave me this idea through work that he's doing with Chris Danforth and others. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> We're meeting later. Look forward to it. Uh, <laughs> is thinking about the ways in which green spaces and national parks could facilitate kind of mental health happiness outcomes. And so what we did was we spoke to Facebook. I have a lot of friends there. I was actually graduated in the same year as Mark Zuckerberg, and so most of my friends all headed out west and started working with him. <laughs> and so I finally was able to use that for something beneficial more than having a lot of Facebook friends. And so just understanding this idea that green spaces or nat national parks could have this mental health value, and to also think about how long that happiness recharge could last. And so I know that they're doing work uh, using Twitter and green spaces, and I think it would be really interesting to broaden this to not only the US, but to look at all kind of English-speaking countries globally that utilize Facebook as an interface, <clears throat> and to get data from India, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, UK, et cetera, all these countries where they're posting status updates in English, and to see if there is a relevant effect from where they're located. And so, really just trying to figure out how much do people like nature? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> And so also, moving into this eco-epidemiology of the plague, we've been monitoring these tender populations now for two years, collecting blood samples and also looking at kind of this wildlife-human interface by radio tracking. And so what we're doing, so tenders make up 70% of the wildlife consumption locally. It's hugely relevant to their uh, subsistence diet. So we have tenders. We're doing marker capture, also collecting all the ectoparasites, so the ticks, the fleas, etc. We're also drawing blood to look um, for RNA viruses and also to look for Yersinia pestis, of course, um, and doing the radio tracking to look at that interface between how they're traveling, where they're traveling, and how much exposure humans actually get. So that project is ongoing. We're also, through our human health and data collection, collecting fecal samples. And so we have a 15-month daily dietary database right now. Uh, collecting this time plasma blood samples from people to look at a whole suite of micronutrients so we're not only just focusing on anemia we're looking at iron zinc vitamin b12 all sorts of fatty acid profiles um, controlling for things like AGP and CRP which are kind of immune response outcomes that would affect uh, nutritional status we're also collecting fecal samples to look at intestinal parasites and to do microbiome studies very interested in how potentially exposure to different parts of biodiversity or how land use affects could affect. So this is an example looking at the skin microbiota and atopic response, which is basically allergies. Um, so this is showing that people's access to biodiversity changes their skin microbiota, which changes their immune response and changes their predisposition to allergies, where biodiversity actually has this beneficial effect. And so we're interested in people's kind of not only food consumption behaviors, but exposure to biodiversity impacts their microbiome and analyzed through their fecal samples to see if that has relevant health outcomes as well. And finally, going into the other things that we're collecting, we're doing a daily dietary record for 15 months in 150 households. This was a major, major undertaking. These are examples of the daily diet calendars that people are doing. They have kitchen scales where they're measuring to the nearest gram everything that they're consuming. There'll be this massive <laughs> dietary di database. We're in the process of entering it into a computer right now, which is a nightmare. Uh, but it's going to be beautiful data once it happens. And again, looking at those suite of micronutrient outcomes. So this was previously, we were just doing a finger prick to look at uh, hemoglobin and look at anemia. This was right on site. Now we're going into doing blood smears to look at malaria, filter paper to look at the genotypes of malaria and also uh, potential zoonotic disease, and also collecting tubes of blood uh, to look at plasma nutritional values and also plasma zoonoses. So this involves centrifuging <coughs> blood, spinning it down to plasma, cold transport, as Taylor mentioned, which in this remote rainforest area that I'm working in is not easy. And so all of these kind of case studies that I'm bringing together is really just trying to show you that this is not going to be the standard rule 
but there are many examples in which conservation could be seen as a public health intervention. And really what Heal is trying to do is to demonstrate some of these relationships, to show ways in which maintaining intact ecosystems could serve some sort of public health benefit. And this is really to broaden constituencies of people that are interested in intact ecosystems. And so as one area of research that I think is particularly exciting and far less complicated than my terrestrial ecosystem is to think about a marine ecosystem. And here, sorry, this is a bit slow. What if something like industrial fishing comes into these remote islands who are heavily dependent on fish as a subsistence resource, completely wiping out all of their local fish supply? And here they're doing the saying that it's just going to destroy this kind of reef ecosystem and destroy people's flow of fish. There could be ways in which... Wait for it. I know. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Removing industrial fishing, having some sort of marine protected area, which then allows fish populations to rebound, and they not only kind of stay within the boundaries of a marine protected area, because there's no fences, but they also spread out as a kind of sink population to all these other areas that then benefit from these areas that are then conserved. And so I think measuring the nutritional impact or the livelihoods impact of marine conservation could be a really exciting avenue for HEAL. And finally, one of the things that HEAL is really trying to do is to have policy leverage. And so recently we had the Madagascar Minister of Health come out to Harvard and kind of look at all of our laboratory space and meet with all of our partners there. And she's just really overly enthused about this idea that ecosystem management, conservation, could have this tremendous public health effect. And I think that this is exactly what we're trying to do is to get new areas of people excited about what we're doing to find ways to further the benefits of conservation. Of course there's going to be examples where it doesn't work but we're trying to find some of these kind of exciting win-win solutions where it does. So I just wanted to say thank you, Taylor, for hosting, and then everybody else that has kind of participated in this work or funded it, so thank you. Okay, I got time for questions. I'll just let you... Perfect, yeah. Um, back to your anemia study. Sure. So how did you distinguish the people who are anemic because of a nutritional deficiency versus uh, malaria versus tapeworms versus, I mean, because you're in the sub-Saharan right. belt of all sorts of other reasons for anemia? Wait. Can you and everyone else just tell Chris who you are when you ask a question? Because part mm -hmm. of the point of his visit is to see who's who. Yeah. Um, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> well, I don't know you. Uh, I'm Chuck Pulse. I'm a physician and I have a long-standing interest in ecosystem changing human health. Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry I'm not going to get a chance to speak with you today, but maybe some other time. So, the question... Sure. Thanks, Chuck. Okay. So, in my initial study, which was part of my PhD work, which is what I presented the results in that PNAS paper, we measured malaria from oral recall. And we controlled for intestinal parasites with a length since they'd been last dewormed. So very, very poor ability to control for those clearly confounding variables. What we're doing in our new study that's this 15-month kind of longitudinal study looking at uh, a whole suite of micronutrient markers is collecting fecal samples at the beginning, end of the study, and during diarrheal episodes and looking at each of the, using both microscopic and molecular techniques to identify intestinal parasites. And at each blood draw, when we collect plasma for uh, nutritional analysis, we're also doing a blood smear and uh, collecting an RDT and doing dried filter paper on, uh, dried blood on filter paper to do a full malaria workup. And so we'll get both pre presence and absence and also levels of parasitemia. So in answer to your question, we attempted to control using my tiny $20,000 budget from National mm -hmm. Geographic for my PhD study. Now with the study, we are actually able to control for some of these other factors that clearly influence nutritional status. So I just maybe follow up question then. When you're making your policies, how do you know that it's not better to spend more money out on malaria vaccine? Because we would find that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying so the information that you're going to gain would not only just say, well, should we be eating bush meat or not eating bush meat? Yeah. It would be... Should we be investing more time in changing environments for Absolutely. malaria, or should we be doing something to get rid of exposures to tapeworm, like running around bare feet in you know agricultural areas and things like that? Absolutely, we would find that out. It's not the 
target of what we were trying to look at with our study design, but I still think the way in which we're analyzing our data would speak to that. Yes? I'm Sam, I'm a master's student here. Um, I mean, clean water seems like the no-brainer that ecosystems are generating water that, that particularly in developing countries where bad water supply is such a health risk. I'm guessing that HEAL is looking at that to make that demonstration? Sure, so we have one HEAL module that is looking at a case study of this, and we also have a project that's ongoing where Taylor is actually the lead, looking at uh, a synthesis of existing environmental data and the DHS, which is the Demographic Health Services data, mm -hmm. to look at the value of upland conservation and kind of maintenance of forest cover in a watershed mm -hmm. and the downstream effects of waterborne illness, specifically diarrheal disease in the case of DHS. And so we're trying to do a more global analysis of that with our effort with SUSINC, but we also have a case study in Fiji looking at upland forest conservation, the effects that has on river sedimentation, and the effects that that has on uh, waterborne illnesses with a focus on typhoid. Mm -hmm. So clearly something that's very, very interesting. I didn't mention it today. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. <laughs> yes? Just kind of the first, the first question. I'm, I'm wondering how this uh, approach follows the population as they get rich and develop. Uh, when we get to our level, mm -hmm. we know that people like places like Vermont as long as they have enough money and so on. And we study uh, pollination on blueberries, but we don't really depend on blueberries. We depend on grain fields in Iowa. So uh, you started with an idea that you were optimizing over a couple of variables. So I guess my question is, what's this ultimate metric that you're going to use, and is it going to be great? That's a great question. I don't think we've totally answered it. I hope it's not money. <laughs> is my initial <laughs> response. Uh, what we're doing in a case like Madagascar is we've thought about some of these issues. So what will happen as people have accumulated money over time. So we've done things, when thinking about solutions to this, we know that bushmeat hunting can't continue to occur at these levels into the future. We also know that people are deeply malnourished. And so what do you do? And so things that we've tried to empirically look at was taste preferences. Do people actually prefer bushmeat? The answer is no. So in this case in Madagascar, number one taste preference across the board is chicken. From a religious standpoint, again going back to the taboos, not a single person has a taboo for a chicken. They have it for almost everything else. Chickens are incredibly important in Madagascar from that standpoint. When you think about it from a development economics point of view, women control poultry assets. And so everyone will always tell you, you want to put all of the money you can into the hands of women, they'll buy things like education, healthcare, food, men will buy booze and a radio. So the more and more money we can put <laughs> into the hands of women or assets into the hands of women, the better. Okay, I should say I'm from here in Dean, by the way, I'm just a fellow here, and I, and I am sort of a contrarian. Sure. No, it's fine. Chicken? <laughs> Great. Yep. Purdue. Yep. Bring Purdue in Madagascar. Done deal. Well, I don't think it's Purdue necessarily, but chickens already <laughs> exist locally in Madagascar. And they are deeply affected by Newcastle disease, so between 70 to 95% of the populations will be wiped out seasonally. There's no vaccine locally available. Also, chickens are very malnourished, which is why their eggs are so fragile and they're so susceptible to disease. So I think there's very simple strategies of improving livestock to then wean reliance off of bushmeat, where people are pleased because it's a taste preference. Also, from an economics framework, domesticated meats are so much more expensive than wildlife. And so if we increase the production of domesticated meats, reduce the price, people might actually naturally switch away. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.